looking forward as we do weekly for a different variety of topics here on, on the Sunday evening experience. And today, once again, as no other, is uh, David Schroeder, our dear friend, joins us, clinical and spiritual social worker and professional life coach. He has 30 years of experience in the human development fields and in his private practice, Transition Pathways. David offers a variety of techniques to assist individuals, couples, and groups in finding healthy pathways to love, higher awareness, and greater potential. He conducts workshops and retreats on such topics as Just Be Love, The Soul's Journey, Spirituality and Self-Esteem, The Path to Consciousness, Conscious Relationships, and The Power of Being. Distinctions between spirituality and religion is David's topic tonight, and we look forward to what he'll have to share about that. Good morning, folks, or good morning, good <laughs> afternoon, or good evening. What is it? <laughs> uh, happy Sunday, regardless. <laughs> uh, so tonight's talk, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, spirituality and religion and the difference between the two, because there are some major distinctions. And I'd like to start out with the uh, first kind of what is religion? That question of what is religion? And the word religion in Latin means to bind oneself or to commit oneself. And um, believe it or not, there are approximately 4,200 religions in the world today. And so this means there's 4,200 ways to bind or commit oneself. Have fun with that. Religion, especially traditional religions, involve offering a duty and a commitment to a god and to a particular teacher or prophet, such as Jesus or Muhammad. And religion is more about morals and what's deemed right or wrong by the religious leaders. And they take the teachers or the prophets' messages and the leaders of the church or the religion interpret these messages and create what's known as doctrines for man's understanding and, and guidance and use, if you will. And these doctrines often offer a moral compass and a structure, which many people want a form of structure, believe it or not. But yet this moral compass is somewhat dictated, if you will, by those leaders. And it can often be not quite the same as perhaps the original teacher or prophet intended. And these doctrines dictate how people should conduct themselves primarily in order to win God's favor. So conventional religion offers um, rituals of worship and praise to their particular God. Um, and it's often a public or group centered um, orientation. And it's designed to be a source of comfort and advice and encouragement to people and in, in what they would hope to be a supportive environment and community. And they often offer, to some degree, they offer inspiring and comforting messages. And the rituals are often very powerful and, and beautiful in many ways. Um, and the music can often be very touching and inspiring as well. Think of religion, like many organizations, as a system. And so forms of governments around the world, and in, the, in our society, for example, we have our own government, we have an education system, we have a, a corporate system, we have a financial and a health system. And these particular systems within a country or a culture, um, there's rules and ways of kind of helping the masses 
through this particular system. And we, as those masses, were kind of asked to adhere to these systems, whether we kind of like it or not, or agree with it or not. And it's a way of a system can function, the way the masses can function in a particular society. And so these systems require the group to conform, to kind of go along with the program, if you will. And, and the system doesn't want you to be different per se, or step out of the norm. And many of you that are part of the cult, uh, Coptic Center or a spiritual endeavor in general, <laughs> we've kind of, we don't really fit the norm. And so we've kind of stepped out. And uh, so we're kind of seen as a little different and maybe even uh, we're not working the program, so to speak. And perhaps many of you have had some difficult situations with the system. And that's part of why you don't quite buy into it so much anymore. I view traditional religion as a system um, and it's a form of governance. And so it has, a, it's a structured institution and it has a hierarchy and it has the norms and the group rules to follow. And it's not really interested in you becoming self-actualized in those systems. And they don't want you to really be liberated or free. They want you to just go along with the program. And so it will struggle with independent thinkers and people being, if you will, out of the box. This was Jesus. This was Hamad Bey, this was Martin Luther King, and many others of the great prophets and masters of the centuries. But Jesus in particular was a major radical and he was shaking it up big time at the time of his ministry and such. And he didn't, to my way of thinking, he didn't have a religion. He was, he came from a Jewish tradition, a Jewish family, yes, but he didn't really promote an, a particular religion. He just promoted love and living in divine ways, as best I can tell. And the structure of many religions, as well as many systems, especially in our country and many countries around the world, is often dominated and controlled and oriented toward a male energy and a male hierarchy and so it's dominated and oriented to fit a male the male energy in ways not so much the female and for centuries religion has greatly in, in, um, influenced nations and their governments and other aspects of society like science and culture and the family value I'd like to read you from Luke 6 and the man with the withered hand to give you an example of the structure and the church leaders and how they began to see Jesus as he was breaking the traditions. On the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and he was teaching and a man was there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand, stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful, to, lawful on the Sabbath to do good? or to do harm, to save a life, or to destroy it. After looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. 
and he did so, and his hand was restored. But they became filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. That is, in my estimation, Christianity. And Jesus was trying to break that mold and break, break that paradigm. And he paid for it with his life. And many of the great prophets and teachers, not just of religion, but just for humanity in general, over the centuries had paid a price for doing what God really intends us to do. Like Jesus, in the mid 19, in the 1500s, Copernicus discovered that the earth revolved around the sun. Oh my goodness. This was a radical claim at that time and that undermined the church big time because the church had convinced people that the, the earth was the center of the universe. And then in 1610, Galileo came around and took Copernicus's work. And he further convinced and made more concrete evidence that yes, indeed, the earth does revolve around the sun. And like Jesus, Galileo was put under house arrest for the rest of his life by the Catholic Church. In the Old Testament, it says that if you channel or if you are a medium, you are considered the devil. You are working with the devil. But one of the major channelers in the world was Jesus. He was channeling the word of God. Have you ever had people ask you, are you a Christian? And how do you answer that? And more importantly, what happens to you with your answer? When I have that question answered or asked of me, more often than not, it doesn't go well. It doesn't end well. And I'm used to that. I don't let it bother me because I choose to be in my truth and just convey a way that I can understand without judging them, but I wish they just wouldn't judge me quite so much. But to be a Christian in many ways means, do you believe as I believe? And to me, that's not love, that's called control and ignorance and ultimately fear. The book and the movie, The Da Vinci Code, and the movie came out around 2006. Many Christian groups and churches told their members, do not watch this movie, do not pick up that book. Because it was going, it was sharing religious mysteries that were being protected by the church leaders for the last 2000 years. And they didn't want people to know or have a different take on what could be the life of Jesus. And they were afraid of how it would shake up Christianity. But part of that book in that movie was revealing the potential, the possibility that Jesus had an intimate relationship with Mary Magdalene and that they possibly had children. In our country, religious doctrines and rules are impacting today the government and the courts. But yet there's this thing called the separation of church and state. And more so today than ever because of the, the changes in humanity and many people waking up, many conservative people are getting fearful. So they want the courts and the government to more dictate how we're living our lives 
And we see that, especially in the last few months, how things have been shaken up, such with Roe versus Wade and things like that. I view the philosophy of many religious organizations, they advocate that a belief that God is out there somewhere. So you need a third party to intervene with your communication and your, your communion with God, that you can't do it on your own. Today, religious hierarchies remain blinded more so now, even in this day of 2022, they're blinded by the fact that women are becoming, and well so, they're becoming more empowered. The feminine is rising. And they should have equal ground and equal merit with their wisdom and their capabilities to be leaders. Not just in religion, but in governments and healthcare, you name it. But this has long been stifled, especially by the religious institutions. The relationship with Jesus and Mary Magdalene, they were the balance of the masculine and the feminine energy, that everything should have that balance. It shouldn't be one more powerful and overpowering than the other. It should be more power with, not so much power over or power under. There is progressive movement in religions. And they're breaking in that progressiveness, they're breaking free from the old paradigms. And they're starting to include women in more leadership roles and their worship services. And so they're becoming more including rather than excluding, which was the old paradigm. And to me, this embraces more the, the concept of unity and acceptance and love. My older sister and brother-in-law, they live up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I grew up Catholic and uh, they're still practicing Catholics, but they're in a very progressive Catholic church. And it's probably been 15 years ago now when I was up there visiting <coughs> excuse me, um, their church. Um, the women, some of the women will do the, the Eucharist. And when the bishop first found out about this, he went, he went nuts. And the congregation pretty much told the bishop, and their, their priest was very liberal, radical. But the congregation, not just the priest, but the congregation told the bishop, you mess with us, we're out of here. We're done. Uh, and my sister was one of the ones that did the Eucharist, so a mass I went to years ago. I witnessed her in front of, at the altar, doing the Eucharist and being a part of the communion offering to the parishioners. So that's religion in a nutshell. Let's turn to spirituality. The origin of the word spiritual is the Latin word spiritus, which means breath. And breathing is very uh, essential to our human life. And this, therefore, spirituality is about breathing. And so it's, uh, spirituality is the, I believe, the essence and a big part of our life. In Jesus' language of Aramaic, the word for breath was ruha, which means breath. So spirituality is more personal, I believe, in its philosophy and the formats. It takes on a more holistic and mind, body, spirit approach. And it has an o a more holistic and overall view of one's well-being and one's connection to the higher power and the universe as a whole. 
as religion is more of a man-made doctrine and laws, spirituality seems to be more guided by divine and universal laws and principles and ways. And spirituality encourages us to explore and to discover, and more importantly then to integrate concepts and aspects of life, for example, to explore the divine wisdom within our own higher and wiser self, and to integrate that wisdom in order to awaken and remember our own true and divine divinity and self. And that source or God is within all of us, as well as around us. It's not just totally outside, it's within, as well as outside. And spirituality promotes more inclusion and one's connection and relationship to nature, to the earth, and to the all of the universe. And its intent is to help one connect in a higher consciousness and to open one's heart center. And it connects and embraces to the metaphysics of life, the seen and more importantly, the unseen and the mysteries of life. True spiritual seekers seem to have an interest in moving beyond their ego. And they want to heal from the inside out and do the inner work, as Jesus would often express, with a desire to live more from their heart center. And spirituality seems to encourage more the exploring or the exploration of the soul. And seeks to ask, and more importantly, explore life's most transforming questions, such as, who am I? What's my purpose for being here? What's the meaning of life? And how can I serve humanity? And spirituality allows you to control more of your own individual journey and your own purpose. And it seems to offer an abundance of resources to assist you on that journey without really dictating you have to do this or that. And like the spiritual masters and teachers of many traditions, true spirituality creates a confident person and they release themselves from the group think and they become more independent in their mindset and ways of knowing and being. And they are more, in general, more non-judgmental and coming more from love and acceptance and unity and that sense of oneness. And they understand the master's teacher more fully on a deeper and more heart-centered level. And they don't seem to take the text quite so literal. They're independent thinkers and doers, and they sail on their own course of destiny. But they seek to connect with others and like-minded people. And they want to hear other people's views and perspectives, as well as share their own. And so there's a lot of focus on acceptance of the differences and honoring the similarities. And there's more of a mutual respect for each other's path and journey. There is a quote, I don't know if you've ever heard, religion is for those who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for those who have been in hell and working their way out. However, true spirituality understands that heaven and earth are just not so much a place as they're more of a consciousness, they're more of a thought system. Whereas many traditional religions, there's a good place and there's a not so good place. 
in my view, the major distinction between conventional religion and spirituality is spirituality advocates more inclusion and love and unity. It views the natural world as a sacred space. And it has a childlike curiosity of the universe and our connection to all that makes up the universe. And spirituality sees the God and the divine in all of us. And there's an equal honoring uh, and value of both the male and the female in the leadership and the teaching roles. Many traditional religions are about fear and shame and guilt. The Catholic religion, which I grew up with, and I was an altar boy and all that fun stuff, Yes, was, was and in many ways still seems to be a religion of shame and guilt. And it promotes fear of God. How can you have a relationship with somebody or something if you fear them? I asked that question once to a religious group. All they could do was rattle off a bunch of Bible passages. I thanked them for my response and I said, I choose love, not fear. Thank you. Have a good day. To me, a major distinction is also religion tells you who you have to be. Spirituality invites you to discover who you are or who you can be. And I believe the key is the realization that humans and all of life are inherently spiritual. And we all come from the same source. We are spiritual beings having this thing called a human experience. And to me, spirituality affirms that there can be many paths to the divine and inner peace. But spirituality, we don't need a fancy building. There's not a lot of fanfare to connect with God and that inner self. And many people in the spiritual path, they connect with their higher power into life in more natural and more informal and surroundings and ways. And it seems that more, the more spiritual the organization, the less they ask about money. Because they know how to be with money and they don't let the power of money overcome the true meaning of God and abundance. And spirituality encourages exploring different texts of different cultures and religions. They want you to learn mindfulness and meditation, being in nature and participate in life enhancing skills of yoga and such. And they encourage visiting different cultures and traditions around the world in order to expand the consciousness and connection to others and to source. A number of years ago, I had the privilege in Chicago of meeting this very powerful and profound yogi from India. And he, there was probably 500 of us in a group and he took us places that were just absolutely incredible. And at the end of his two hour presentation and such, he gave this philosophy and this worldview and so I would ask you to imagine what humanity would be like, what we would all be like if we would in, embrace this philosophy and understanding and ultimately this way. He said, humanity is our uniting religion. Humanity is our common denominator. Breath, our uniting prayer. We all breathe and consciousness, 
our uniting God. The more conscious we become, the more aware we become, the higher understanding we will have and the higher meaning we will have of God, the source of all. To me, that's spirituality. And that's what Jesus and many of the great masters of many traditions were promoting that philosophy. I thank you. And I'll take any questions or comments. I have two, David. One, how do you answer when someone asks you if you are a Christian? And the <laughs> second one is, do you find that there are more Catholics that are have turned to spirituality? Because it seems like a lot of the spiritual people that I deal with, they're they were brought up Catholic. Yeah. So to answer that first question, uh, Connie, yes, uh, many of my circles over the years, uh, and I spent, uh, before moving here to, to Michigan, I spent uh, the first, you know, 55 years of my life in Illinois, especially Northern Illinois. Um, and so, yes, many of the, the groups I've been in over the years, we are... We many of us had come from the Catholic tradition. Um, what I found is the more you study the Bible, the more you study the Quran and other texts of different religions. Um, I've been to um, several ancient or you know foreign countries, South America, um, France, much of Europe. Uh, we've been trying for two years to get to Egypt, but, um, and anyways, um, Therese and I, we've walked the steps of Southern France, Mary Magdalene down in Southern France. Uh, so as you, as you study the different traditions and you study Christianity that much more, but you look at it in, in more of an open-minded frame and you study more of the lost gospels, of Thomas, Judas, Mary, um, I actually have come back to a greater understanding of Jesus and Yeshua. And so uh, in answer to that, sec that first question about how do I answer it? <laughs> I tell people, yes, I believe in, in Jesus, very much so. Uh, I, I channel his energy. I, I've written a book that was guided by him. Um, and so, yes, I believe. And, but I, I have, you know, I've expanded my my vision and my version of who he was and is and what he was really about. And pardon my French, that pisses people off big time. And I'm to the point, well, I'll give you an example. Was when I first came here, Teresa and I went to a... Um, a festival in one of the civic uh, squares in um, here in town, and there's some religious group. They had this big sign that fear, said "Fear God," John three sixteen or whatever. And I said to Teresa, "I said, can you give me five minutes?" And she says, "Oh, do you have to?" I said, "Oh, just stand over there. It'll be fun." And so I went up to the guy very, you know, openly and shook hands and said, "Help me understand." How can you have a relationship with somebody or something if you fear them? And like I said, all he could do was give me three or four passages and, and you know, and I said, sir, I appreciate it, but you really didn't answer my question. And I choose love, not fear. Have a nice day. Uh, when I came here and I was uh, a program I wanted to try to promote here was called The Power of Being. And I went to Forest View Forest Hills. Or Forest Hills. And I kept saying the word universe, universe. And the gal stopped me abruptly and she goes, you mean God? Uh, yeah, they're kind of one and the same. That was the end of that. I never heard from them again. That was the end of that program. <laughs> I, whatever. In the energies that are coming, 
in the new consciousness that's coming. The church, they're in for a major WTF. As things are going to get more exposed and whatever, yeah, they're, they're, it's not going to be pretty. And, and what's really happening right now is because as the energies are changing, the old school is hanging on to everything they can get while they're getting still good. But they know their days are numbered. And, you know, these new energies and ways are on their way and they're creeping in more and more. But these guys are, it's the ego that's very threatened. And so they're doing what they can do while they can still do it, so to speak. So you just kind of have to realize that that's part of the cycle and part of the start of the, you know, chaos is uncertain order. So this is all part of the process and don't get too caught up in it. Just realize it's how everybody's acting and reacting. But there's going to be a, and, and, and the momentum is shifting more and more. There, yeah, it's going to be a major awakening and a lot of people are going to go really wacky. And I've been saying this for the last several months. Most of us, what we would, they would call woo-woos. <laughs> They're actually going to be knocking on our door and going, you guys know something. Help us out. So just be patient. Don't be judgmental. Just they're going, you know, like Jesus, his parable of the vine. They're either ripe. You're either ripe or you're unripe. You're either ready or you're not. And we're all at different stages of ripeness. We're all at different stages of awareness and consciousness. And that's, we're just seeing that more evidently. And the, and the church and the government, little by little, they're losing more control. And more and more people wake up and say, we're not buying into this. Yeah. But it has to get a little more crazy before it gets better. That's part of the human, <coughs> like nature, it has to, you know, nature has to get a little worse before it gets better. There has to be a little bit more destruction and damage. And then there's that rebirth and rebuilding and such. So that's, and that's kind of where we're at right now. We're in between these two worlds and that's where all the chaos and the uncertainty is. And you just have to kind of just ride the wave and don't get caught up in it. Thank right. you. Yeah, a long-winded version, hopefully that helped. Oh no, that was great. That added to your talk. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, David, um, in case uh, you or anyone else is interested, um, I wanted to uh, add that I watched a half hour video today um, that's called uh, Jesus in India, Tibet, and Persia, an account missing from the Bible. Ah! And no, don't, do, don't say that. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, was, it was great. It's on YouTube, by the way. Um, but it was so great because it, it explained why the Catholic Church was so adamant about yeah. making sure this kind of stuff was never mentioned. That, you know, right. Jesus went to India and to Tibet, you know, was studied with a Tibetan monk. No, no, we can't have yeah. that. <laughs> he was all over the world. He was, he was here with the natives. There's yeah. a wonderful uh, saying, as the Christians brought whiskey and gunpowder here the white man uh and they were preaching christianity they kind of echo that uh boy they um the indian the native said your jesus as you described him must have been native american because the way you describe him is the way we live hello but he was just he was as much a a uh a, um, a student as he was his teacher so he was yes he was all over the place being both the student and the teacher. I I've heard heard that he was that he by located that it you know mm -hmm. he could be in no, no. the Native Americans no. and he could be in Jerusalem. Yeah. And you can too is what we were told but that was taken out of the Bible too. Yeah. yeah. And if anybody's heard, read the book you ran show this is a big book I think the the yeah. show you watched would have been a whole lot faster than the book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's yeah. a big book. That's a big book. Yeah. Hey, Dave. Oh, so, yeah, Lori. It's, uh, and a lot more of this information, it's not, it's more mainstream now. So it, it's, it's being tougher and tougher to suppress this information. It's sneaking out. Um, and yeah, more and more people are asking questions. You know, when, 
when I went to France, and that's where Therese and I met, I started in Paris. And then I took the train down to Marseille to meet the rest of the group. And the difference in in Paris, uh, northern France versus upper or southern France, of how they saw Jesus and the relationship with Jesus and Mary was like night and day. Down in southern France, they knew the two of them were together and they had this love affair and there was children. And, and that was a big reason why she had to go to France because she would have been the next one, would have been crucified or whatever. Um, but yeah, down in southern France, uh, there's a, there was a totally different take and view of, of that whole relationship with Jesus and Mary. Yeah. Hey Dave, this is Pete, yeah. Pete Wheeling. Can you can you talk about all about meditation? Meditation, how important is it for spirituality? Um. <clears throat> well, I'll put it to you this way, Pete. It's my understanding that Jesus, in the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, he would go off by himself to meditate, period. <laughs> uh, and that was his communion and, you know, connection to God and such. So, you know, and that's one of the things I tell people, Connie, is the very thing you say we shouldn't be doing is the very thing Jesus was doing and was promoting us to do, which is meditate, channel, Tune in to the higher voices of ourselves and, the, and those higher beings. Um, and meditation, prayer is, to me, this is me, prayer is talking to God. Meditation is listening to God. And we should be listening a lot more than we should be yakking and talking, for sure. Beautiful. Yeah. I I read, again, your answer, the, the one in particular, it's like people were just clamoring for prayers. And so he reluctantly <laughs> gave us a few of these rote things to memorize. And as a former Catholic, I will say I found a lot of meditative calmness in reciting the rosary. And I now realize it was more meditation than than the actual that so so it's like oh that's pretty funny my my own mala beads um in the back of the book that i wrote a number of years ago um there are 14 priest prayers from around the, uh, the 14 major religions out of the 442,000 religions <laughs> there's 14 peace prayers um and these are the 14 major religions around the world and what i did was i took one line from each of those prayers and made it into one prayer. And they're basically all saying the same thing. They're just giving it a little different flavor from their, their side of it. But I made 14 prayers into one prayer just by taking one line or so of each of those 14 prayers. Um, Therese and I had the opportunity three or four, uh, must have been four years ago now, we went to the Parliament of World Religions up in Toronto and it was a happening with I don't know how many different religions were there, but you know it was an it was a a wonderful sea of humanity and acceptance and just being present with each other and whatever. Uh, and we just decided there's a group of us. Uh, the the parliament's going to be in Chicago next year, so if anybody's interested, it's going to be at McCormick Place uh, in Chicago, so not too far away. Uh, I think it's sometime in the middle of September, but if you August. Like August, August, okay, 14, you, August 14. If you Google World Parliament of Religions, uh, you'll see the that website. And yeah, it's going to be kind of in our backyard. So and it's quite a, it's a wonderful it's happening of, of all religions and traditions. And uh, in a lot of ways, it was a, it was a wonderful love fest, if you will. Um, even though there's political and things, you know, that, that are a part of it all. But yeah, it, it was just to have that world humanity in one place was was quite a, a love fest quite an education in love fest yeah so anything else yep we got the pup parking in the back um, question for you um email was forwarded to me about a week and a half ago into john davis as well and john please chime in on this um it's focused on 
uh, the Sphinx eyes closing. And it wasn't photoshopped in. I don't know if anybody else got that email, but it, it was fascinating that uh, uh, the, the minds of men and women are closing their eyes to, to Jesus' teachings and, and opening their, they need to open their eyes towards higher consciousness. Or I guess this is my interpretation of that video. But um, what is your take on that um, with, with the, the 4,200 religions around the world, <laughs> <laughs> which I wasn't even aware of? Well, and uh, how, how can that be unified and, and to find that balance, I, I suppose, of the, the spiritual view that we do as Coptics and, and, and light workers? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, Michael, the, the biggest key is the more we transform and transcend the ego from this thing of separation and, and, um, and that I have to be different or, and, and you have to accept me kind of thing um i think the more we can honor each other's differences and and accept those differences and more importantly embrace and honor the similarities that will be a big key to creating heaven on earth um uh, and in, but it's going to take people really doing their own healing work of, of healing their own core wounds from childhood and past lives, for, for that matter. Um, and so that they can truly find their own divinity and their own love and innocence and goodness within themselves, that will then transform and transfer to them being more accepting and seeing that you are me and I am you. So it's not out there. It's almost like closing your eyes, looking inward. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, yeah. Michael, on that. Our true power is changing from the inside out, not so much, and looking within, not so much looking outside of us. But the ego is all about looking out there. The last person I, and where I really want to look is, <laughs> you know, uh, inside. And I see that every day in, in my work, naturally. Um, and we've been conditioned to look out there. That's been part of the program, is to look out there and not to feel. And to disconnect from the heart. Um, and don't trust your intuition. Uh, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So so. Part of the religious side of things, the control. Yeah. But I am curious if I can ask John Davis, which I recently read a fact that was so discouraging. Somewhere between 70 and 80% of the sacredness that we supposedly would find in Egypt had been taken and hidden in the Vatican. Am I the only one that's ever read that, John? Oh, it's, uh, of course, I went to Egypt uh, when I was in the travel business. I went 30 times. Yes. And uh, went up to Chakras and spent a lot of time, a lot of time with the Sphinx. And the Chakra system goes up the, the back and the Sphinx is right here. Right, right there, okay. right between the eye, right between the eyebrows, and okay. it's, it's one of the great statues of, of ancient Egypt. But it has to do with uh, becoming Christ consciousness, and that's what yeah. Coptic is all about. It, it's become a, a a humble Christ consciousness, embracing all religions and all philosophies. And what, Thank you. what David was talking about tonight was. It's very close to Coptic philosophy because copy is not a religion. Copy is a philosophy and embraces all people of all nations. We pray for all nations every day. And the, the, and the, the opening of our chakras, conscious, subconscious, superconscious, and then send it to all people of all nations. And, and also, and then pray every day that every nation wants to be, be be absolutely free, and and we we are here to develop and create peace on earth within us. And when David just gave a fantastic presentation. If I can add one thing, the um, there's a gentleman by the name of Neil Neil Downitz Cloth. He's uh, a scholar on the Aramaic Jesus. Um, and if you Google him, um, the, he does the Aramaic 
or the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, and he gives you, he speaks the Aramaic language of it, as well as shows you the words in Aramaic as it relates to the to the the English version or the common version as we know the Lord's Prayer. In the in his Aramaic language, Jesus he makes no distinction between heaven and earth. They are one and the same. Um, so if you're interested, yeah, just Neil Donald Cloth or Douglas Cloth, uh, Aramaic Jesus, and yeah, you, he'll if you, the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. You see how our common version, how it's been twisted and turned, versus his original yeah. version, if you will. And there's actually uh, the the Sufi with the Universal Dances of Peace. There's actually a wonderful dance that goes to that song and those words um, of the Aramaic Jesus. So it's it's quite powerful to witness that uh, that circle dance, if you will, with that those words and such. So during one of my trips to Egypt, we we uh, we went to a, uh, a place that was very, very in Paris, and there was a statue of Mary Magdalene. And so I said, do you want to go in? Oh, yeah, we all want to go in. And we went in, and there was a story that was told. And here, and here is what it was told. Jesus married Mary Magdalene and had children. Now, I don't know if that's true. We, 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 we don't know, but it, it does make sense. Yeah. But there was, it, it, was, it was just amazing. It just put us all into a wonderful understanding that this whole thing dealing with Christianity and Coptic and, and what you talked about tonight is the real story is being told. And boy, you did a magnificent job tonight. Stand, and and I want to add real Stand, quick. Uh, standing yeah, ovation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can I add real quick that if you read Jesus, my autobiography, he tells about his marriage to um, uh, yeah. to uh, Mary Magdalene and they're having children. He actually yeah. tells that story. I have the book if anybody in Grand Rapids would like to borrow it. <laughs> yeah. And the, re the reality is more and more of another version, if you will, another truth is more and more coming out and and just to read if you read nothing else if you just read the gospel of thomas and to me which is that one of the truer versions of what jesus really intended with a lot of uh, his passages and such uh, yeah the gospel of thomas really gives you a totally different take on where he was coming from and, and his intent with things yeah i have one more secret uh, to share with you Jesus did not die on the cross. Oh, God, you did it again. Oh, I can't stand this. You're bursting my bubble there. He lowered it he, on the cross. He, he, he lowered his heartbeat to three or four beats a minute. Yeah. And then, well, I and, read, and, and then, and then he was laid, laid in front of the cross. And so people, if they were to touch his heart, it's only, he had it down to three or four times a minute. Which, which, in most conditions, you're, you're dead. Yeah. And yeah. when Coptics were, you know, traveling around the country doing these things, yeah. at Easter we had to tell the story that he did not die on the cross. Yeah. Uh, the the resurrection was the energy of humanity's fear. Exactly. The res or the the crucifixion was humanity's fear. The resurrection. Was the energy of of love jesus is love and he proves through his uh the whole three years of his ministry he, he was saying to us all this is my interpretation of it that listen folks it's not going to be easy here you're it's you're going to have tough times you're going to be accused of things that you didn't do and and so on and so forth and you're going to take some hits and you you might even be nailed on a, on a, on a wooden stick. Um, but he, to me, he, he proved that this thing called death does not exist. We do not die. All death really is is a transformation of one energy state, which is physical form, which is temporary, back to the eternal. Now, remember, remember, yeah. they probably believe this. Yeah, and so the, 
remember you the don't earth, need to fear death because it doesn't exist the earth is is not our home it's a school right it's a school of mastering ourselves so we come from the heavenly heavenly to come to earth to learn to manifest and to learn to master ourselves and graduate from the earth plane on the inner dimensions so boy a lot yeah. of a lot of secrets have been revealed tonight, and I know we all had a great time, didn't we? Wonderful. Thank you all.